Well, hello there, beautiful shrimp people. In today's video, right, we're going to do hashtag number one of our Q&A session, right? And this is going to be kind of like an uncut version because I plan to do very, very minimal uh, cutting and editing on this type of video, right? So what will happen, guys, is I will go up into a little corner and there will be some stock footage of shrimp, macro footage. It'll be all different types of shrimp that you can watch while we do our Q&A section. And if you would like then please do ask me a question in the comment section below and we'll try and answer it in our next video. Now, what is very interesting as well guys is uh, with this type of video you're going to get everything in it, you're going to get me coughing, you're going to get me farting, <laughs> all that kind of stuff, you're going to get my stuttering, everything. You're going to get it all in this type of Q&A section because yeah, I find it very hard to edit this stuff out very fast and when you do daily videos guys it becomes quite the chore right so you're going to get all that you're going to get all of me in your videos you're going to get stop breeding you little mother effers you're going to get all of that in my videos right so i'm going to have a clipboard here as well and i'm going to actually guys read from the clipboard because i had the strangest thing happen the other day i asked you guys in my community tab uh, do you have questions for a q a video and there was lots and lots of questions and i went to it this morning all i did all i wanted to do guys was uh, print it off, go to my computer, uh, copy it all, print it off onto uh, my printer and stick it on here and read the questions out. and I go to the community tab this morning and all the comments from that question are gone. You can go and look on it now, I've actually put on it there myself. Where are all the questions? Where did they all go? And so it's like something technically has went wrong with that post or something else has maliciously went wrong with that post, I don't know. I don't know if moderators on my channel can actually uh, delete comments uh, from my live streams if they are actually able to go into comments on my videos and delete comments. I hope I'd, I would like to think that's not what happened because I like uh, most of my moderators are like my friends and stuff. So, but you never know. I've, ne I've never really noticed it before, but yeah, that is that. Uh, we always have our coffee, like always. And guys, as I said. You're going to get farts and coughs and everything all rolled into one today. I feel pretty yucky today. I felt like this probably for the last three or four days. Our daughter, she works in the kindergarten and uh, she comes home with COVID and everything. The lot, she comes home here, here family, have more diseases. I'm like, get another job, get another job, you little biatch. Anywho, anywho, let's get on with our questions because we have about nine of them to go through. So, do you, right, so I'm going to go over my notes as well when we're doing this because yeah, I don't want to miss stuff guys. I, I try and say things in my videos and then when it comes to making the video, when it comes to looking at you guys in this little camera here, you tend to go blank and you just forget everything, right? So it's always good to have notes. I can't memorize all this crap, so. <laughs> uh, let's see. All right, we're going to get on with the questions, right? J4 Life asks, how can I move my shrimp tank full of shrimp inside to a new shrimp rack? Right, Jay, that's very, very easy to do. All you need to do here is drain your water all the way down. <laughs> right, put it into a bucket or something like that. Move your shrimp, rot, your, your actual tank, physically pick it up, put it in its new position, then put the old water back in, and that's it. Huh? I don't, I don't get your question. Oh my God, Jay, for life. Uh, question number two comes from Leslie Foster. And by the way, guys, in the next video, once we see if the comments are actually fixed, I'll actually put your comment with your little picture and stuff up on the screen as well. Leslie Foster asks, do you sell shrimp or is it just a hobby, right? Um, right now, it's just a hobby and it probably will remain a hobby. Guys, there's a lot of stress with selling shrimp and I just don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. It's just horrible, right? When you're actually thinking about if one shipment of shrimp actually gets to the person for the entire week. You literally think about it constantly. Right? And then when you have like 10 packages with loads of shrimp, and then you have to deal with customs, and then you have to deal with things like uh, people not paying tax on the shrimp, and then you have to deal with things like, uh, like the shrimp dying, for example, on transit, and you're having to send them again, or give the person a full refund. It's just an awful lot of hassle, guys, for well, basically is, like, for example, if I sent 10 painted fire reds to Sweden and just say it costs, I don't know, probably like 
I don't know, thirty dollars or something like that for the shrimp. It probably cost maybe ten, fifteen dollars for the actual shipping, right? So it goes to their country, and then they, they have to try and deal with the tax of it, and you have to deal with the paperwork, and it's some um, guys. It's it's so much stress just for thirty dollars. It's like absolutely not worth it. And there's the other thing as well, right? For me, ethically, I don't think it is acceptable for me to send a living animal in a container that might be in that container in the complete darkness with no moving water for up to two weeks at a time. If they just say the package gets lost, it's seeing its death in the darkness kind of thing. So, um, yeah, but I mean, I, I still buy shrimp. I still buy shrimp and stuff online. But when I'm buying them, guys, I'm buying them from um, places within Norway or I buy them like overnight delivery kind of thing, right? So I'm not a big fan of sending shrimp and having them in the post for so long and all the hassle that comes with it, right? So Leslie, I hope that answers your question because that was a good one. The next one is a wall of text and this is from Ricardo Duarte Gomez. That's some name you've got there. It says, hi Mark, comment section, got a question for you all. About a week ago, I got 20 red pintos. During the first few days, everything just went fine, and then all of a sudden I had two deaths. Two days in a row, I have more deaths. Five days, uh, five more days passed, and no more deaths for now. The tank is cycled and matured. Uh, we used to grow out some apistogramma fry, and it's been running for about a year and a half. Note that, guys, year and a half. Soil is ADA Amazonia, and I use arrow water with salted shrimp GH+. The shrimp don't accept any food. Note that as well, guys. Five different types, three different brands, and although I see them scavenging around the tank, they don't seem as active as my neos that he has in his other tanks. My parameters are pH 5, which is quite low. Uh, the breeder had them at pH 6, but my arrow water comes out at pH 5, so note that as well. TDS 0. That is interesting, your TDS should not be 0. Uh, GH 5. Five or six, wait a minute, his arrow water is zero, bad, my bad. So his water is very, his, his filters for his arrow are very good. Um, ammonia doesn't say, nitrate zero, nitrate under 10 parts per million, which is good. Temperature 21.8 to 22, which is good. TDS is 138 parts per million, which is good. Is there anything wrong? Should I be worried? Never had, a, had such high grade shrimp. I don't know if, if I'm doing things right. Thank you for all the. the the advice, have a nice day. But that's a very good question, right? And the things, guys, I wanted to note there was um, how old his active soil was. So that is a red flag for me straight away. One and a half year old soil. It just basically means you have to change your soil at your tank. And what were the other red flags? Um, arrow water. Did I see... Did I see TDS zero? That was a red flag. That, it wasn't a red flag because we just... Uh, Decided that it wasn't. Let me see. I'm going to read through it very quickly. All right. He says he's. This is another sign as well. Your soil's done, is when you start to get lethargic shrimp and stuff in a bee shrimp tank if they're not very active. Oh my God, my voice. <coughs> if the shrimp are not very active, it's a good indicator that the soil is done and something's kind of wrong with the tank. So Ricardo, I would say that the best thing that you could probably do is is set up another tank, and set up another substrate in that tank, probably ADA, because ADA is pr probably generally accepted as probably the easiest and best soil that you can get. And yeah, just make that jump, do it now, because that is one thing we're all guilty of in this hobby is, I'm really guilty of it guys, because I, I tend to try and give soils as much a chance as possible. And sometimes it can go on from like seven months, eight months, a year, and still no breeding, you're like, oh, maybe it's something I'm doing wrong. Yeah, you should really just change out that bad soil and get it over and done with. So that was a very good question. I hope I answered it adequately enough for you. You need to change your soil. Some coffee. Derek Quetet is the next question. This is question number four. What is the biggest mistake you've made with a shrimp tank? Biggest mistake with a shrimp tank? Um, I've made lots of them. Lots of small mistakes. I can't say I've ever killed a whole tank by something I've done. Um, yeah, I, I, that's, a, that's an odd question for me. I've never, I don't think I have any really big mistakes. Let me think about this more, big mistakes. 
Big mistake. So one of them you could probably, I'm, I'm not sure this is even a big mistake, is putting shrimp straight in the tank without any kind of acclimation. <laughs> That's probably a big mistake. I have never had, I don't think I've any, had any catastrophes. Well, maybe, maybe a Sulawesi shrimp tank, that was a big mistake, was not putting on a heater controller on that one. But that was down to ignorance, so it's not really... I, I can't blame ignorance if it's still my fault. I still blame myself for that, guys, by the way. Faulty heater, yes, but should I have a, had a controller on there? Yes. That's probably my biggest mistake. Right, that was a very good question. Thank you, Derek. Question number five comes from Dax875, and it's, he asks, If you could only keep one species in colour, what would you choose? Now, that's a very good question. Uh, only one shrimp? Only one? Well, there's one guys that I, one shrimp I go to guys that, um, that I go to every day, and I'm like this with my magnifying glass looking at the babies and whatever else and it is my galaxy fish bones the shadow ones that have the blue hue through them there's something about the pattern on the back and the the bark line and, and the little dots in the head and yeah they do it for me so they're the ones uh, um, I don't know I, 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 this question probably comes down to this as well right the harder the shrimp is to keep in my opinion the more joy you get from it when you start to see baby shrimp and stuff. So, Galaxy fish bones were probably my most expensive. Would they be my most expensive? Yeah, probably were my most expensive. So, uh, guys, my stuff is very, very cheap, my shrimp. Silabases so were like $20 each, right? And I didn't pay anything else for my galaxies and stuff. I got them for free from a friend. Um, Neos were all relatively cheap, Opa Uli were all relatively cheap, Crystals were all, all relatively cheap. Everything else I got was quite cheap, so I know that they're a little bit more expensive and harder to keep, so that's probably why I get a little bit more joy. It's not just that as well, I mean I love the pattern on the back. And I've never had boa yet, I've not had them, but uh, Fishbone Galaxies are my numero uno, I think, for keeping them in the tank. I still love things like Blue Bolts and uh, King Kongs and Wine Reds and all that kind of stuff, but yeah, Galaxy Fish Bones are the ones I love. That's a really good question as well. Thank you, Dax875. Mr. G says, uh, high and low points of your experience in the whole hobby, high and low points. A high point would be getting my new shrimp trim because it has made such a difference in the way I look at keeping shrimp. I'm actually enjoying myself keeping shrimp again, guys. And I don't mean just keeping shrimp, I mean um, actually making videos. It's the reason why I've started doing videos daily again because I actually enjoy it. I actually love doing this. It's, guys, there's, I've, there's never been one single day in my entire life when I've kept shrimp that I've thought, yeah, I don't want to do this no more. I don't want to do it. Any reason that I've thought about not making videos is just to do with the YouTube side of it. It's not to do with the shrimp keeping side of it. But yeah, I've uh, highs and lows. What would be the lows? So the highs would be getting this room, going off on tangents again. Highs would be getting my room. You guys, even though it's just a basic basement for me, it's a lot. I can expand, I can have any shrimp I want, I can build things and I can make more videos. Uh, highs, lows would be, what would be the lows? What would be the lows? I thought I saw a crack in the tank there. I can just, I can just feel this corner in this tank, it looks like there's a wee crack. Lows, I'm finding it hard to think of a low. Oh, low. Uh, oh, God. We, we briefly mentioned that they're one of the biggest lows. I actually shed a tear over this as well, so it shows you how upset I was. I was angry and very upset that I let these shrimp die in the way that they did, and that was the Sulawesi shrimp again. Heater failure. Cooked the shrimp. Yeah, that was a nasty one. I actually felt really, really bad for them. They, they, they had to live in conditions like that as well before. And, guys, it wasn't just that they, they, they were kind of cooked as well. The heater that was in there, if you remember the video that I did on it, the, I, I complained about my hand feeling weird when I touched the water. It was an actual electric shock I was getting, it was like a minor electric shock, so I'm not sure if the shrimp would have felt it in the tank, but yeah, I felt really bad for them. And uh, I was gutted in the end when I couldn't save the tank. No matter what I did, I couldn't save the tank, so that was a very bad low. Very, very bad. Let me see where I was. Where was I? Let me have a little drink to make sure my throat is lubricated. And Mr. G, thank you for that question. Uh, TMA 
1818 asks, recipe for nettle mix, please. Best food ever. N recipe, right? So you have nettle mix. We have Montmorillon and clay. I'm going to give you the details and why I've added them into my shrimp tank, into my shrimp food as well. Uh, so the main ingredient was nettle mix. It was roughly about, let me think about the ratios here, maybe almost 50% of the actual food was nettle mix itself. Um, I did do variations on, on it with um, spinach sometimes. I actually did use, uh, what is it called? Oh, zucchini sometimes in the well because I was trying to get the texture properly. I even used uh, sweet potato sometimes as well to try and get that texture a little bit better. Um, I used uh, wheat, normal wheat that you use for making bread a few times and it wasn't good guys. It wasn't good and the reason wheat isn't good guys is because it makes the food rock hard which isn't good. And then when it does eventually go uh, soft it kind of just collapses on itself into like a little I don't know, you, if, you, if you understand what you're looking at, you would know. Uh, so that was changed to rice bran, which worked wonderfully. Rice bran, as you know, guys, I've been a big fan of it for a long time on my shrimp keeping. Uh, we used uh, krill, was one of the ones that we used in it. We used uh, fish flakes, powdered fish flakes, the stuff that I used in the back here. And guys, it was a thing I used to add to the shrimp food because... I don't know what it is, probably the, the actual fish smell in it that shrimp love, that they would go berserk for it. So I'd put it in the tank. You, it was very noticeable if I tested it. One with the fish, um, fish meal basically, fish flakes in it. If, if there was one with fish flakes put it in, one with no fish flakes put it in, and you put it into the same tank, they would all go to the one that had the fish meal in it. So that was that. Um, what else? Pollen was one of the ones we added to it as well. We also added, um, uh, what was it, bacillus bacteria, uh, bacillus acidic, acidicus, bacillus, is it bacillus acidic? It was one of them ones that I added, it was bought online in powder form, it was added to the food. Uh, what else? Oh, one of the ones that was very, very important was Montmorillonite clay, and it wasn't just that it was good for the shrimp, this one guys, it was actually for a purpose. Right, if I didn't add Montmorillonite clay, the food wouldn't sink. So it served two purposes. It gave the shrimp minerals. Montmorillonite clay has a lot of mi minerals in it. Montmorillonite clay has a lot of minerals. My God, I can't even say the word. So we used to add it for uh, minerals for the shrimp and to, of course, help it sink. I think I mentioned pollen, did I? Did I mention pollen? That was also added. Off the top of my head, I can't think of anything else. Pollen... I can't think of anything else. Uh, hey guys, if you're wondering why I stopped making all the shrimp food and stuff was because um, it was becoming too hard to source all the materials needed to make it. And uh, it was a combination of two things. Right? It was becoming too hard to source all the materials. And guys, I'm disabled. I'm physically disabled. Right? It was getting way, way too hard for me to do shipping of shrimp, shipping of foods and orders and whatever else. The other thing was, um, because I said it was too hard to get things, it made it impossible for me to have my shop run properly. Uh, because I was having to pay like a premium. I wasn't just buying stuff en masse online or from a supplier. But I was buying it and then I was having to pay like a premium to get it through um, Norwegian Customs. And sometimes the pre that premium, guys, was almost more than the value of the product. Right, so I was having to add that premium on top of the price. And realistically, when you're looking at it, who's going to pay like $10 for a feeding dish, a glass feeding dish? Just say I bought it for $2. I sent it away to my friend, right, and he'd get them laser engraved with Mark Trump tanks on it. And then he had to cover his costs and stuff. You're talking about $7, $7 to make the thing, right? And, and then I'm trying to sell it to make money, remember? I'm trying to sell it to make a little bit of money. So... Even if I had just a couple of dollars on it, it's not worth it. It wasn't worth it at all. So there you go. Where were we there? My God, I went off on a big tangent there. That was just about from TMA1818. That was the question about recipe for nettle mix. Oh, my God. Thank you for that, TMA. People in the comment section will be kicking you in the butthole for asking me a question that I went off on a tangent. Uh, Shrimple Stuff asks, if being a shrimp overlord wasn't your main hobby? 
and content then what would you do as your hobby and YouTube content in other words do you have any other interests they do actually guys that's a very good question because some of you will know this right I, lo I actually love getting outside um, I am disabled but the, one of the things that helps my disability is walking right so if um, if I don't do exercise regularly what happens is my spine becomes so curved it is physically hard for me to stand up not my sp not just my spine it's my spine and my hips right it is uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the condition it's uh, ligament hypertrophy is one of them ligament hypertrophy where it's a thickening of the ligament right so I have that in my spine which means that the ligaments that go through my spine, right? So for example, this is a good, really good one to explain to you. I'm bending over, right? And uh, you, no dirty thoughts at the back there. I'm bending over to tie my shoelaces, right? And I'm bent over for one minute tying my shoelace, right? And then when I start to go back up, I can't physically straighten my body up because my ligaments are too thick to go back through my spinal column. It's something like that. That's how, that's the issue I have with my ligaments in my back, right? Um, so anything that I do for any length of time, just say I'm bent over like this. Again, you guys at the back there. If I'm bent over like this and I'm cleaning the glass on my tank, right? And then I put the thing down and I'm trying to straighten back up, right? My back physically won't straighten up itself. It takes me a long time to physically straighten back up. So that's one of the things that helps me tremendously with this is walking. Just simple walking. The more I walk, the better it gets. So that is one of the reasons why uh, years ago, before we got our puppy, that we thought it was a really good idea for us to have a dog to give me exercise. And guys, I don't think we planned it to be, I don't think we planned it to come to the point where I was walking as much as I do. I try and walk the dog here at least two or three times a day. And we're walking probably for about, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes at a time. And that's good enough for my back. As I said, I get a lot of pain in my back if I'm just sitting like this, for example. But if I sit like this for maybe an hour, something like that, I, I probably will struggle to walk for the rest of the day. So that, that is the condition of my back. Um, but if uh, your question was, what else would I do? My God, I went off on a tangent again for my hobby. This leads me on to what that part is in the walking, and that is I like um, touring, which basically means going to somewhere for the day or a couple of days and walking around seeing all the sights and a lot of the times guys this will involve uh, camping I've always had a little bit of a fascination with camping especially uh, survivalist camping and I don't mean like going into the woods and uh, lying on the ground and pulling some I don't know like pine branches over yourself and trying to survive the night that's not what I want to do right I want to go and I want to be comfortable and but I want to go and I want to learn how to camp properly um, because as I said, right, I have a really bad back. I've tried hammock camping, which is very, very good. Right? I love it. Hammock camping is awesome. When you get to a place and you have a couple of trees and you're able to sling your hammock between a couple of trees and look across a lake or that's still calm on a blue sky day and you're like, oh, this is the best thing ever. That's what I love. Right? But the thing about hammock camping is... is um, you, you basically can't lie on your front. <laughs> Can you imagine the shape of a hammock, how it's kind of like bent like this? Right, I, I'm, because of my back, right, I, I get a lot of relief from turning from side to side like this all night and lying on my front, right? I don't typically lie on my back because I snore so much, the wife hates it. But, um, yeah, that is that, right? So that leads me on to the other bit. I love camping. Now, if I've not went off on a tangent enough, I love, I love camping. So if I had to have another channel... And I do actually have another channel about this thing, like touring and camping and stuff, and there's a bit of fishing and stuff in there. Um, that is probably what I'd do. I would like to think that going into next year, uh, going into this, the rest of this year, that I would like to have um, a little bit more input into that channel. It's kind of been a little bit dead, guys, but it's always been one of those channels where I just post when I go camping. Right? So it might, some years it might be like three videos a year, other years it might be six videos that year. Last year, I don't think I posted a single one. But last year, I was very, very busy with my website, right? It took up all my time. I wanted to get it up and running just so that it would start earning some little bits of money, you know, because that is, that's why I do all this stuff as well, is all these little bits and pieces. It's better to have your all your eggs not in one basket kind of thing. So, yeah, 
That was another big tangent. Guys, you're going to love my Q&A sessions, aren't you? Because I just love tangents. <laughs> All right, that was question number eight from Shrimple Stuff. Thank you for that, guys. And you'll be relieved to know that the next one is actually the last question of the day. And that is number, question number nine from JT Keeping Fish. When did you get into the hobby and why? Let's answer that first because it's a two-part question. When did I get into the hobby? Um, I got into this hobby a long, long time ago. It, a lot of people, it depends guys on how you look at this, right? I kept my first fish when I was a, probably like four or five or something as goldfish from the market. Right? In Scotland they have markets that go around the towns with uh, roller coasters and all this kind of stuff. And there's one where I'm from that came, that comes every year in April I think it is, called the Lynx Market. Right? And then in those days they used to sell uh, goldfish and bugs, my god, I, I can't imagine how horrible it would have been for those poor fish in those bugs in a market that was so loud with music and smoke and flashing lights and yeah, uh, I would never buy them from a place like that again, but yeah, that, I think that was probably my first experience of having fish. I remember when I was a kid as well, we used to have uh, terrapins, <coughs> terrapins a few times. I remember when I was a small kid um, at my grandmother's, I always wanted terrapins, so I think that's why they got terrapins for me. Terrapins and goldfish in the same tank, what could go wrong? Um, so that was my first experience into the hobby. My, my general experiences as I got older were, like for example guys, I was still <coughs> living with my parents when I had uh, probably about eight tanks, I need a drink of water, before my voice goes. Yeah, I was still living with my parents when I had about eight, eight tanks. My whole room was just absolutely full of aquarium dry. And I, guys, I always remember this when I was out with my friend. We were in a nightclub once, right? We met these girls and we're chatting them up as you do, right? And he turns to the girl I was chatting up and he says, has he told you about his fish tanks yet? And I'm like, shut your mouth, boy. Shut your mouth. How dare you? God, but girls don't want to know about your fish tanks in your bedroom. Anywho. Uh, so, my first experiences as, seeing it as like a hobby where I did something myself would pro was probably when I built my first aquarium, which was when, uh, guys, I think I was maybe about, I want to say about 12 years old, I built my first aquarium. And the first fish I ever bought myself was a red swordtail. Right, and guys, I loved them. They actually bred pretty fast for me, these little things. I, I had no clue what I was doing. I can't even remember if I had a filter. It was just a basic tank, some plants. I probably didn't cycle it or anything. And yeah, this little glass container was in my bedroom and and uh, we got some red soil tails. And I think, the, I think the plants were actually plastic. And I always remember the first day, guys, when I saw uh, this little tiny red thing, like this size. Just swimming around all these plastic plants, and then there's another tiny little red thing, and they'd had babies in there, and I was like, oh my god! So you could, I think this is probably what got me hooked on it at that time. And from there on in, I've always had aquariums. I think every house I've ever had, I've had aquariums since then. Uh, but getting into getting into the uh, shrimp keeping side of it was was more of when I moved to Norway, and that was because. Uh, be when, before I left to come to Norway, I, I lived in uh, Scotland, you guys all know I'm Scottish. I had koi carp. I still had aquariums and stuff in the house, but I also had koi carp. I had a really big pond. I loved it, guys. I loved my, my carp. But then when I came to Norway for work, um, I lived in a little attic, someone's attic above their garage. Right, So there was very little room in this thing. Basically a sofa, TV and a bed. And that was it. And downstairs was a little toilet and um, a little kitchen. And that was it. So I bought, I think, do I not have the, I do have the tank here. You guys can't see it. You see it's up here. This tank up there, that one, was my first tank I bought in Norway. That little tiny thing. And yeah, at, at this time I, all, I knew about setting up tanks and stuff. So I went and bought the tank. I got all the stuff for it. I got the filter running and whatever else. And I went to the shop, guys. My plan was to get some guppies because guppies are quite easy. A nice little fish to watch and they're easy to breed. And when I went to the shop, I saw uh, crystal red shrimp, right? And I bought them. I bought crystal red shrimp and 
they lived in this tank. They, they lived in the tank for quite a while. They never bred or anything, but they lived in the tank until they died out of old age kind of thing. But, um, yeah, that, I think that was my first experience with properly keeping shrimp. I remember in Scotland, though, guys, when I used to keep other fish and stuff, I used to buy cherry shrimp, right? And many, many years ago, like when I was in my 20s, I do remember keeping a little glass-type shrimp as well in aquariums. I couldn't tell you what they were. They're probably a mano shrimp looking back. I think that was it. But I didn't properly get into shrimp keeping until I came to Norway. So you're talking 15, 20 years, something like that. Uh, and that was that, really. That was that. So thank you for that question, JT, keeping fish. It was a long one. Guys, what you'll notice with my questions, I, I tend to go off on huge tangents. And then it's hard for me to remember what the original bloody question was. <laughs> Let's see. Where are we? So that was the last question. Right, if you want to ask me a question, you want, to, you want your name to appear in the show next week, what I'll try and do, guys, as I said, is hopefully whatever this glitch is with the comments um, on our last community tab post is fixed or I've dealt with it because I have a funny feeling someone's been naughty and deleted the comments. Uh, we'll get your names on the screen here and we'll ask some questions. Let's see, what else can we say? So today, uh, so that's today's questions, guys. If you'd like to ask me anything else, then please do. If you want to support the channel, then please uh, become a channel member or consider buying a t-shirt. That helps me out a lot. Remember, I've got tons of shrimp to feed, so uh, they, they need lots and lots of food. So get that going, get the channel memberships going. Guys, as well, you, the benefit you'll get from it as well, you get a little bit of channel recognition here on the screen somewhere. Um, let me see, I'm looking at the last part, can't remember. Guys, uh, if you want to watch another video, I'm trying to get this one right. Yeah, I've, I've got on my notes here, point towards the Opa'ula tank mark. Guys, if you want to watch another video, then please click on here. And I'll see you on the next one. Subscribe and like. Happy shrimp keeping. Over and out.